Hi, this presentation is about my video game Spacecraft Tactics. It's about a technical breakdown of my game to provide some insights how it works under the hood. An alternative title of this presentation is how a game works because uh, of course many of these things in general also apply to other games. So um, yeah, I hope you will enjoy it. Okay, first some words about me. I'm 37, I'm from Germany, and in my professional career, I'm a software architect and tech lead. I'm responsible in these roles for the integration platform of the leading logistics platform in Europe. And we are integrating hundreds of in-house systems and of course also all popular ERP systems. Spacecraft Tactics is a one-man project, so um, I really want to emphasize I'm really doing everything in my free time, including coding, game design, graphics, sound, music, everything that is also related there that is not technical. The project started in 2016, so I'm already working for quite some time on it. I'm nearly on the finishing line, and yeah, I hope you enjoy that presentation. So, um, first a slide about the game. So, Spacecraft Tactics, your mission is uh, save the last rebel outpost from the Empire. Um, to do that, you have to micromanage your ship. So, control your crew, take care about the energy distribution, uh, do damage control, repair systems. There are also, of course, uh, for example, cables that uh, have to be taken care of. Uh, your ship has uh, various meshes like an energy grid, a shield grid, O2 pipes, network, of course, uh, to control all the systems from a console. Um, your ship has fields like uh, obviously a shield field, but also, for example, a, the rooms have O2. Your crew needs that and so on. You have to do tactical fights. Um, first of all, of course, vision is a big thing and also situational awareness. Um, there are also, is also a subsystem like EM emissions. Um, you have to control your ship and you are doing that by controlling the thrusters and it's really like in space. Uh, you have some thrust and thrust vectors and this is how you control your ship. But of course there's also assistant flight mode so uh, let's keep it easy. Uh, you have to manage your capacitor charge. There are multiple kinds of capacitors for the energy grid, for the shield grid. Um, you can play that game in multiplayer. There are various game modes. Uh, you can play it co-op or PvP on the same ship with multiple players or also on separate ships. There are official servers hosted by me, but you can also create your own dedicated server or even embedded. This means that uh, just start a game, um, open a port in your router, and yeah, then you can also, then also other friends can join your game. There's a built in ship editor where you, where you can build your own ships and also share them, of course. There's a built-in scene editor. With the scene editor, you can build on levels or scenarios and also share them and play it with friends, for example. Uh, and uh, there's also full native mod support. So starting simple to have an easy way for custom tile sets, but uh, going a bit more complex uh, to customize all the different entities in the game. So for example, give some laser weapons, different properties. And um, there's also a possibility to write and really code on mod with Groovy code. And uh, of course, of all these points, I will go into details a bit more during the presentation. Okay, first, uh, let's start with an overview of which applications we have. So, of course, first of all, the game client itself. So basically, the application that uh, players uh, starting and playing the game. Then of course there's also a game server. There's a dedicated variant but also an embedded game server directly embedded in the game client 
So for example, that a player can just invite friends, open a TCP port, and then they can play together. But uh, that embedded game server is also needed for single player games. Then of course, everything just internal, so without any internet communication or something like that. There's also a meter server. The meter server provides matchmaking and other functionalities. I will go into detail later about that. There are also some tools. Um, one tool is the entity editor. With the entity editor, you basically define really everything, all properties uh, of all the various entities in the game, like uh, systems, like weapons, like propulsion and so on. I will go also into details about that later. There's an internationalization editor where basically all the um, yeah, different translations of different languages are maintained. And uh, there is an admin UI. This is uh, mainly used by me. So uh, with the admin UI, I can uh, check the health of the official servers quickly. I can see and check error reports. I can do some operations also uh, about the official servers. And I get some very high level statistics about the usage. So like how many players were logged in and so on. There are also two tools uh, integrated in the game client that are also very important. First of all, there's an integrated ship editor where all the ships, stations and so on are created. Also by me uh, when creating the um, campaign. But this ship editor can also be used by players to create their own ships, play own scenarios, and also um, even play the campaign with own ships. Then there is the scene editor. Uh, with the scene editor, you basically create levels. Uh, I call them scenes or stages. This is also used by me when creating the campaign, but um, can also be used by players to create custom scenes and then play them also with friends, for example. So this is a bit uh, more formal view about all the components. Um, so first of all, we have the main applications. So the client, the server, the meter server. We have the various tools like the admin UI, the entity editor and the internationalization editor. Then um, these also have shared code, of course, and uh, there's a game lib. The game lib is basically, let's say, the private part of all the shared code and implementations. And there's a shared lib. Shared lib is part of the SDK because on the right column, we also have, of course, many mods. I already mentioned that game has full native mod support and actually as you can see, game core, lobby, ship editor, also all main parts, uh, let's say business logic parts of the game are really implemented as mods. This ensures that the uh, mod interface is really capable and provides everything that is needed that really mods can create it properly. So going a bit further. Um, yeah, so a game engine, of course, consists of different subsystems and uh, yeah, the main subsystems are of course uh, storage. So you need to store data, load data, all the assets and so on. So static assets, um, there are also of course dynamic files like save files, like uh, ships created by players and so on. So this of course everything has to be managed. Then there is of course network and uh, in particular I'm using the uh, Grizzly framework for all the networking and uh, will be a slide later to get into detail about that. Security is an important part, especially when talking about mods that could be also created by external uh, parties, uh, by other players. So um, we are using a Java security manager and in general sandboxing is a big topic. Serialization is important, um, that basically uh, data objects, data transfer objects can be transferred from the client and server and vice versa. And of course, also uh, when talking about the storage, also can store it permanently. Messaging, 
is important because uh, a the the engine the game client itself consists of several different components i will also go into detail about that later but there's also communication between client and server and even the meter server and all of these applications and parts of the whole system have to communicate with each other also um, on a higher level than just on the network layer so um, there will be also a slide about that Next is world, a bit different, but um, of course uh, you have a world that you are basically representing in your game. So in that world are things like asteroids, like uh, spacecraft, like uh, AI enemies, stations and so on. And all of these um, entities have to be represented in a world. So with coordinates, for example, and uh, for example, also you need to index all of these things that you can find them quickly and so on. There's it will be also a slide about that. Mods, I already mentioned that and I will also go into detail about that later. Modules, um, this is a bit different from mods. So mods is basically uh, modifications or let's say plugins uh, in a more classic uh, application. And modules is, um, of course, there are several parts of um, the, the engine in general about the game client, the server and so on. So many different UI dialogues, many different other functionalities. And uh, there will be also a list later. And uh, so this has to be managed, of course, and should be broken down by many, many modules that it can be also managed uh, from implementation and development point of view. There's internationalization is, of course, an important part because, uh, of course, the game supports uh, multiple languages. Entity definitions is important because, um, oops, um, basically, I already talked about uh, these entities like uh, laser weapons, like propulsion and so on. And all of these uh, things have static properties like for example i have a laser weapon size s and a laser weapon size m size m of course uh, has more power but also needs more energy so i don't need to hard code that somewhere but i can define that with that entity editor uh, i showed before and last but not least the renderer because uh, yeah it's it's a game so it also needs of course a nice representation it has to look like a game so you need to render that and about all these things will be slides later so this slide is about uh, the network so there are basically two types of uh, networks implemented in the game it's about the communication between the game client and the game server First of all, the in-memory network. Oops, I um, maybe already mentioned it, that of course the uh, server can be embedded also in the client. So like, for example, when just playing single player uh, or when um, hosting a game on your local machine and friends can connect via local area network or via the internet with port forwarding. And in this case, of course, uh, the client and the server can communicate just in memory. So it's basically a Java blocking queue. And this is how they communicate then. Uh, as soon as uh, there's a remote communication over the internet, um, I use the Eclipse Grizzly framework. It's a so-called Java NIO framework. It's not important what this is, but uh, this uh, Eclipse Grizzly uh, framework basically operates in different layers and filters how you realize your network communication. And the last uh, layer, of course, is the transport layer. So this is also then managed by the framework. So um, basically the TCP socket, which is a streaming socket, is managed by that layer. And then there are other filters that are on top implemented by me that uh, realize the um, needs of the game engine that I have for that game. So first of all, I need to ensure that from that TCP stream, which is really a stream of data that's coming in from the um, yeah, receiver point of view, 
you need to reconstruct so-called datagrams, uh, basically like uh, message packets. So a datagram is a single message with a defined length and a defined content. So, so you need something to reconstruct these datagrams from a streaming socket. Then all the network communication is also compressed with the set standard uh, algorithm. That's a state-of-the-art compression algorithm. And uh, it was originally uh, yeah, invented by Facebook, but in the meantime, it's quite a standard. Next is object serialization. I use uh, Cryo for that. And then last but not least, there's a filter for integration stuff like session management, activity tracking, statistics, and so on. This is on a high level how the um, yeah, networking works. But of course, this is quite abstract and probably you still don't know how does it work. So maybe let's um, have a look at that from another direction. So um, what is the message flow when the client sends something to the server? So first of all, the client creates a message. It's a class and uh, derives from abstract message. And this uh, message basically contains what you want to tell to the server. There's an internal uh, facade with uh, that uh, there's a call that you can send that message to the server. Then the uh, game core first uh, has to decide which network to use. So whether it's the in-memory network I mentioned before or the Grizzly network that does the communication over a TCP socket. It is queued again because uh, at this point uh, the message will also change from one thread from the client engine thread to a dedicated network thread. So thread basically means things that can be done in parallel, for example, with different processor cores. Um, so uh, then the Grizzly network takes over. Uh, the filter pipeline I mentioned before is executed, so the message is serialized, it is compressed, uh, datagram is marked, and so on. And then it's sent to the internet with a TCP stream. At some point, it, the data packets arrive at the server. Then, first of all, the Grizzly network again receives that data stream, executes the filter pipeline in reverse direction to deserialize, to decompress, and so on. And uh, then puts it to a network connector. It's a separate uh, part. This network connector again separates threads so that the network communication and the logic in the server can be done in parallel, for example, with different processor cores. So therefore, there's again a separation of threads. So uh, on the server side, there is then a game instance. That game instance calls for messages that may be received and then hands that over to a message handler with works on these messages and does something based on that what the client sent. So um, what can the client send? Or in general, of course, also the server. So what can be sent? So there are different types and kinds of messages. Maybe just to pick some out of them. So, for example, uh, from server to client, there is uh, with every turn a session update transferred. So session update means so the game session, what is in there. So like an asteroid moved or there was some damage or some laser was shot and so on. So this is everything part of that session update. It's incremental, of course. And yeah, that's the session update. Uh, bidirectional means that uh, these messages can be sent uh, from the client to the server or from the server to the client. There are some important messages like the composite definition. So this is basically a message that sends a definition of like a spaceship or asteroid, what's, what, which entities are in that composite entity and so on. And there are also, for example, game action messages. These are all let's say one-time actions that occur in the game. Like for example, the player clicked on a button, there's an action behind that button, then a game action 
is sent to the server and the server does something and the client then receives a result. Okay. So completely different topic, mods. So I already mentioned um, there is a native mod support in the game and actually all the uh, also important core parts of the game are also implemented as mods like the lobby like uh, the um, chip editor or the scene editor also lots of let's say basic uh, game logic and of course also the campaign the last outpost and um, yeah how does uh, mod look like so there's of course a folder where that mod is. Then there can be some um, tile sets and in general graphics like uh, buttons, uh, pictures for buttons and so on. There are of course everything sound related like sound effects or music tracks. Then there is in uh, storage where for example ships, AI ships, stations and so on can be stored and uh, source basically contains groovy code so mods can also contain code i will have a slide later about that so don't worry you will <laughs> know later what groovy code is and uh, yeah also some general definitions like a general mod definition um, yeah translations entities and entity definitions in particular action definitions ship classes so everything this is basically a mod and of course there is a manager that man manages all these mods because i already showed before that uh, like the lobby is a mod the ship editor is a mod so we need of course one manager that brings all of them together and on the other side are uh, managers like the modules manager that manage uh, let's say single functionalities that are implemented as a module i will have a slide later about that or for example a scripting manager that also uh, holds a class loader or resource loaders they of course need to operate so like uh, for example when a tie set has to be loaded these of course uh, then need to operate with the mod manager to get to the actual resource of a certain mod Yeah, uh, mods groovy. So as already mentioned, uh, don't worry. You don't need to understand what this is exactly, but this is basically uh, groovy code. Looks like Java code because groovy is a JVM language. Can also look quite different, but it is also almost like Java if you like to uh, yeah, code groovy like that. There are some uh, certain differences to Java, like for example, maybe some of you who can program Java see that uh, the lambda syntax here is different, but uh, there all, are only slight differences. But uh, Groovy is uh, very uh, flexible and you can also code Groovy completely different. So the same class could also really look completely different. And um, the whole last outpost campaign is also implemented really as mod in Groovy code and not in Java code. Also, again, to ensure that uh, the um, yeah, modding interface is really capable. Um, yeah, Groovy allows, as I already mentioned, it's a JVM language, so it allows seamless integration in Java. So it's no problem to, from SDK to import all the uh, different uh, types and classes and so on from the Java code of the of the uh, yeah, main game, of course, or the game core. Um, another advantage of Groovy is that you can just place these Groovy files with that source code, like here, in the mod in the mod di directory, and uh, it just will be loaded at the startup of the game client or also the game server, of course and uh, compiled and loaded and yeah that's it really easy uh, i had some challenges when integrating groovy so one challenge of course is sandboxing because it uh, still should not be possible that especially um, if the mod is not implemented by me but uh, by, by some other players by the community then of course it is important that uh, yeah, they cannot do everything so that they cannot code some viruses or something like that. 
or I don't know, access data from your computer. So for that, I use the Java Security Manager and uh, the mods are quite restrictive sandboxed. Another thing is object serialization. So like sending data from a mod to, to another cli game client, to another player, so over the network, for example, uh, you need object serialization for that. And for object serialization, the, in the game core, the serializer needs to know all the groovy classes, of course. So um, I needed to implement a custom class loader to achieve that. Okay, the next step after the mod manager is the module manager. So as I already mentioned, uh, there are really lots of different components in the game, like various dialogues in the UI, in general different functionalities, like also a menu, for example, or the energy distribution panel, or um, also things like AI execution, for example. So everything are different modules in the game to, to keep everything separated, of course, and also maintainable and manageable. And um, yeah, there's a, manage, a manager that manages these modules. So like, uh, of course, it can load and unload modules. It can list all the modules that are registered and then an, an executor, like the client engine executor or the game session runner, then can execute all the various process steps in these modules. Uh, also, for example, the message handler that uh, receives messages from the client or vice versa from the server. Also, of course, then may have to forward messages to modules that subscribed such messages. A server module, uh, for example, then uh, has certain callbacks like a callback when game session starts, for example, when the um, when the first turn is executed of a game session, or also per turn on a game session, um, there's an execution before all the entities are executed and one after. There's also a callback when messages are received. So um, yeah, this is basically how these modules work. There are different uh, modules. There are, of course, more of them, but uh, some to mention. There are modules uh, for the client UI, like, for example, the main menu or the options uh, dialog. The, there's a social module, basically an in-game chat. Uh, so you can see all the players that are logged into a server and also chat with them. Or also things like the viewport, so that you basically can see uh, a ship in the in the game world this is uh, then uh, provided by the viewport module there are also more uh, in-game uh, logic related client uis um, uh, like uh, the menu bar or that quick action bar on the top left corner of your ship the console where you can uh, control all your different entities or for example the minimap lobby module, of course, also um, all the, the lobby is quite modular implemented. Also on server side, uh, various uh, modules to mention, like, for example, the AI module. I also have slides about AI later on. Or entity controllers, like um, you have uh, certain uh, propulsion um, engines on your ship and um, Basically, in assist mode, you only say, um, you just say, fly to that into that direction. And then, of course, you need a controller that actually um, controls that. There are also on server side modules to control specific logic for game modes. Yeah, so you can see on the list, there are quite a lot of different modules in the game. World Manager. This is another core system that is, of course, very important. So the world manager really manage, manages uh, everything that's in your game world. So um, yeah, maybe let's start with the objects. So um, the um, next um, object, the world consists of our so-called composite entities. And composite entity is basically an entity 
that consists of many other entities. It's a bit abstract, so maybe a bit more concrete. So like um, your spaceship is a composite entity. And of course, in your spaceship, you have walls, you have your crew, you have different systems like an energy generator and thruster, or for example, also a laser weapon. And all of these are, of course, uh, entities. And the composite entity is, uh, let's say, a super entity around that. And um, yeah, we can also see, so the composite entity then has a entity manager and that entity manager manages all the single entities like the wall, like the systems and so on. And uh, the entity manager has certain functionalities like it is a factory for such entities. Um, it has an index that uh, an entity a certain position can be found quickly. Uh, various lookup maps, of course, to find a certain group of entities quickly, change lists, uh, because the uh, the game world, of course, is um, transferred uh, from, from server to client incrementally. So only all changes that were done are transferred. So um, for that, you, of course, need change lists. And the world manager itself manages the composite entities. So it has also a factory, but for composite entities, it has another type of index um, also to find entities quickly. Um, Lookup maps, change lists again, interceptors uh, that uh, you can intercept and get, basically get a callback when certain entities were created or deleted. There's a possibility to shadow composite entities uh, for example, um, when you enter a lobby, load your ship, but have not entered the game yet, then that um, entity, of course, uh, so the ship you loaded already has to be um, somewhere maintained. So it's already in the world manager, but it's shadowed. So it's not in the game yet. Okay, so going a bit more into detail about entities. So um, I already showed there are really lots of different kind of entities. And uh, to to manage that and not to implement and program many things uh, all the time again, again, uh, you derive more concrete entities from, let's say, less concrete ones. For example, you have a, let's imagine there is a laser weapon entity that has a code really that is needed to implement a laser weapon. But there are different other kinds of weapons. So there's also an abstract weapon entity that already contains code uh, that is in general of use for weapons. Then this abstract weapon entity uh, derives from a structure entity. So this contains again code that applies to all different um, types of entities that uh, represent some type kind of structure, like also a wall or any kind of system and uh, also that laser weapon. Then uh, again, this derives from physical entity. So this is then already also from the implementation point of view, everything that really has some physical form can be also not only a wall, but also, for example, a group member. And then there's an abstract entity that is the most basic form of an entity, uh, already defines a certain structure, what they define, uh, what the entity can do and what properties a really basic entity has. And um, another type of abstract entity that is not physical could be, for example, an info entity, which is in turn, for example, a spawn point. So a spawn location that is not physical, but that's also there. And this is also an entity, for example. Entities are also organized in layers. So like there's, for example, a floor entity, a wall entity, an energy conductor, and an energy generator. And um, all of these are stacked on top of each other in different layers. And this is then a tile so that the, um, for example, the energy generator is then also protected by a wall 
and um, has an energy conductor that uh, with the mesh system will be shown later in a later slide that the energy can be transported to somewhere else. This, uh, these are um, again uh, class diagrams of entities. So just to demonstrate what is the difference between a physical and an abstract entity. So the abstract entity really contains basic stuff uh, that applies for any entity. So like an unique identifier um, and reference to the parent. So uh, I mentioned that uh, entities are uh, organized in composite entities. So there's a reference to the composite entity, of course. Then a reference to the entity definition. So all the static definitions that belong to an entity that are maintained and uh, yeah, in, in the entity editor. Then any kind of entity, of course, also has a position in the composite entity, of course. And so on. Also various uh, callbacks and methods like basic stuff to create and update and in general manage these entities. Callbacks to, to draw them, to execute logic uh, on server side on the next turn, for example. This really applies to any entity. Then there's already the physical entity. This is already a specialization of an entity. So a physical entity also has, for example, a health. It can execute an action, has a, this action has a target. It can be enabled or disabled. Um, yeah, there are management methods for that, for these actions, for example. Um, these actions also need a callback because at a certain point they need, they need to be drawn, for example also on server side, of course. So these are already specialized uh, methods and uh, we call it this derives, physical entity derives from abstract entity. And uh, another thing I want to point out is that, as you can see, especially the programmers, uh, entities are not just plain DTOs. Entities are, I call them modern models. So modern models that contain data and so fields properties, but also define their logic on their own. So these are represented by all the methods below. And of course, in reality, there are lots more method methods. This is only, let's say, a part of that, of course, to demonstrate it here in the talk. So um, for example, that laser weapon uh, entity really contains with all the derived classes really contains all the logic that is really needed that a laser is basically working. So there is no external module also needed for that. So similar story for the entity definitions is represent the static properties like uh, I will stay uh, with the example of that laser weapon. For example, um, I have an S size laser weapon, an M and L size laser weapon. And they have different um, power, but also need different amount of energy to, to fire that laser. And uh, this is uh, also represented by these static entity definitions. And they um, are structured and organized quite similar to the entities. This uh, shows the actual entity editor. So uh, that uh, defines the entity definitions. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, there are all the different entities. For example, here we have that console S size, M size, L size. The nice thing is I have three different consoles with three different properties, but this is not in the code, these different properties. So these uh, all these three consoles are implemented by the same code, but only have different definitions in the entity definition. And as you can see, there are really quite a lot of definitions available, as you can see on the scroll bar. And really everything like um, when, when an entity is capable of moving the tiles and where the tile set is found for the animation or audio, or entity can have certain categories for the energy distribution module, for example, can have a cooldown a display name, health, of course, 
it is uh, placed on a certain layer and so on. So really lots of different um, yeah, definitions. So um, this uh, view is now a bit broader. So this uh, basically shows what different kind of business objects are oh, yeah, implemented and available or needed for the game and uh, also some categories of them. So there are general, uh, let's say, library functions like pathfinding or meshes or fields. Uh, all of three have uh, slides later on. There's an environment generator that, for example, randomly generates a nice environment with asteroids in it. Entity networks. So um, entities, of course, um, are connected together in a network. So your crew member logs in on a console and then it can uh, control all the different entities that are connected with a network cable to that console. And this is represented and implemented by the entity network, which entities are, for example, connected and so on. There's a scene loader, which basically loads uh, levels. A ship validator, that uh, in the, if you create your own ships in the ship editor, that they have to still follow certain rules, like they have to be closed and um, and so on. So that the ships you create also make sense. There are uh, these different kinds of composite entities I mentioned. So like mines, missiles, dark matter, uh, scripting composites, so that can contain scripting code spacecrafts, ships, stations. By the way, the difference between spacecraft, spaceship, space station is spacecraft. It's basically every uh, ship, let's call it ship. And uh, in particular, the concrete type spacecraft usually have AI ships. Spaceship is already specialization of a spacecraft and spaceship is a ship where also a player can join and player can control. And space station again, it's a specialization of that. And yeah, as you can already imagine, that's representing then a whole station with some additional logic, like you can join it, for example. Uh, space objects uh, are objects like asteroids, for example. Then, <coughs> excuse me, then there are different um, entities like uh, crew members, floors, structures, systems, um, entity automation, AI manager, AI blocks, um, all of these three are needed for the AI. Entity automation is basically to control your crew and to automate certain actions on your crew. Uh, there's a separate slide about that. I will go into details later. And AI manager and AI blocks are also um, controlling the AI that controls the ships. I will also go into detail about that later. And there are also, of course, uh, also modules and uh, implementations that control certain game modes like the sandbox, custom game mode, tutorial, last outpost, the main missions. And there will also still uh, some other game modes follow, but these are not yet implemented. Okay, then um, yeah, this was the overview and now let's get into some details again. So first uh, let's uh, tell something about meshes. There are different types of meshes. So there's a energy grid, there's a shield grid, there's a network with network cables, and of course also uh, O2 has to be distributed in the rooms. So, and this is done with meshes. A mesh um, consists of several components. There are producers like the energy generator, the shield generator, the O2 generator. There are buffers, an energy capacitor, shield capacitor. And in this case, the O2 buffer is integrated in the vents. And consumers that do something with that resource. So like, for example, consumer would be a laser weapon again or a shield emitter, or a O2 vent. And then that O2 resource again is consumed uh, by a crew member, but this is then a field. This will be the next slide. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, these uh, meshes have certain features. So, uh, of course, there is a base load of uh, resource consumption. Um, this is also shown in the entity details window in the game client. It's the uh, first number here. Then action load would be, for example, if your laser weapon is firing, then of course it needs much more energy than it's just idling. So this would be the other number here. Um, yeah, the production of certain producers or for example generators are of course reduced when the generator is damaged. So this one, for example, is completely damaged and yeah, the laser weapon has no energy anymore and cannot operate anymore, of course. Also, when uh, when cables, so the floor tiles where the cables are, are damaged, then uh, uh, these cables will leak resources. Therefore, it's also important that you don't just uh, create cables everywhere, but only create your cables where you really need them. Um, yeah, destroyed cables also really split the mesh. So um, if this tile, for, or for example, if this tile would be completely destroyed, then that cable is destroyed and then that uh, generator and the laser weapon would not be connected anymore. So the laser weapon would not get energy anymore, of course. And uh, this is this window. Uh, you can also distribute energy between main systems or, or types of systems uh, between 50 and 150 percent. So at certain situations of your tactical situation, you may need to allocate all the resources to your weapons and maybe because of course uh, you don't have infinite uh, energy production and you want to save some energy in your capacitor then you can reduce uh, the thrusters and the engines energy and so on so uh, this is also a tactical element of course the next system are field um, there are three types of fields, uh, two major types, the shield field and O2 field, and uh, also um, healing stations are implemented as fields. And uh, for fields, of course, emitters are important. So um, here you can see, here's for example a shield emitter, and the shield field is uh, circular. This means that in a circle around uh, that shield emitter, the field is generated and uh, I can also see it here maybe a bit. So around that the shield has full strength and um, then this part is not covered by the shield emitter anymore. It still um, has some shield because the uh, fields mix and also distribute. But uh, it's of, of course also fields of course also decay. And because it decays faster, then it is distributed in the that outside area. Uh, of course, then it's not that strong, of course. So uh, there are certain types of fields, the circular fields, shield fields, O2 fields are room fields. This means that here's, for example, a, um, a O2 vent, and this uh, provides then O2 for the whole room. So that crew member that is here then also can breath. And uh, yeah. So um, in case that a tile is destroyed, then O2 would leak. But only if there is no shield. If there is shield, then that shield prevents these leaks, of course. As I mentioned, fields can decay. So also if the uh, O2 generator would, for example, be broken, um, then, um, of course, um, after a certain time, there would be no O2 anymore in the room. And same for shield, of course. So if the shield emitter or the generator is broken, then at some time, then there will be no shield anymore, of course. Um, yeah, what can we see here? Oh, one thing that is important, uh, fields have so-called plateaus. So um, at a certain point, the field has a certain strength, but um, it also has plateaus. This means that, for example, um, this shield field has a limit of strength 10 units, and it has four plateaus. Um, 
if you shoot a weapon, a laser weapon, for example, on that uh, shield, then that laser weapon can only damage uh, one plateau. Uh, or some stronger laser weapons, maybe also two or even three, but only a certain number of plateaus. So a single shot cannot pierce through the whole shield, for example, but then it will spread, of course, over the area of the ship. Next subsystem, pathfinding. This is uh, quite an interesting one. So um, this is the pathfinder in the side of your ship. And um, yeah, there are different approaches, of course, how, let's say, a crew member uh, can find a path to a certain destination, like uh, your crew member is here, and you want your crew member to go to there, to the finish. And uh, it's quite uh, a challenge how to find a good path from there to there, especially there are, of course, also walls, for example. And um, especially the path also has to be found in, uh, in almost no time. So you don't have infinite uh, time to, to find that path. And um, pathfinding is quite expensive normally. So, of course, the perfect approach would be a heuristic traversal algorithm. And yeah, this basically means to, to check and try out every combination that would be possible until really the shortest path is found. This would of course lead to the best uh, result, but yeah, <laughs> uh, would also really take a long time to calculate, even for these, uh, let's say, small uh, problem sizes, also for the small ship sizes in my game. So therefore I have chosen a faster approach. So that algorithm consists of uh, two parts and in total three steps. So first of all, um, a simple traversal algorithm has to find any path. So this would be the red line. It starts here and then it Try something, of course, this path doesn't make sense, but in the end, it finds a path to the finish. But of course, nobody would walk that way. So then uh, the next part of that algorithm starts, then um, you can consider this path as a curve. And uh, what I'm doing then is basically two distinct operations on that curve and uh, in multiple iterations. So the first operation on that curve is simplification. And simplification basically means uh, to make the curve shorter. This is done really simple. Um, I start here, first I go there, there, and then there again. So basically uh, I start here and suddenly I'm next to it, but uh, many steps later. So I can just uh, create a shortcut here, skip that part and really go from, just go from there to there. This is simplification. Then there's another operation on curves. It's called smoothing. So let's imagine we start with the red line. This is definitely not smooth. Uh, with the first iteration, we make it smoother. So we see, okay, there's an edge. So let's smooth it out. Then with the next iteration, it would be yeah, orange. Again, make it smoother again. Yellow, even more smooth. This doesn't um, make the path shorter, but um, enables further simplifications at some point. So there were some iterations done and suddenly with the green iteration, there's a simplification possible again. So basically we start with 50 steps for the red path and after nine iterations we end up with 24 steps and with the uh, blue path and yeah the blue path is quite optimal. And uh, these operations on that curve are quite cheap to implement and to calculate. So um, this is uh, much much faster than a full heuristic traversal algorithm and yeah, really nice way to find path. The next topic is about the AI that controls spacecrafts. So um, yeah, where to begin? First of all, there are different uh, 
kinds of AIs. So AIs with different behaviors depending on the situation. So there's a spacecraft AI that uh, basically behaves like a bandit searching and destroying other ships. Um, but there could be also another AI that should behave uh, like a guard. So guarding something or an escort of a transporter, also the transporter, for example, a space station has to behave differently than an artillery or a bandit again. So there are different kinds of AI, but um, on the other hand, uh, they also have uh, much in common, like they need to control the ships, they need to assess the overall tactical situation and so on. So there are different dimensions of um, yeah, information processing and evaluation needed. So therefore, um, basically the AI consists of three major parts. So the first one is simple. It's the AI server module. And this module mostly just uh, on a high level manages the AI so that an AI can be registered for a certain ship. It contains the so-called orchestrator. I will come to back to that a bit later and also in general holds the state of an AI, but it's more like an organizational uh, part. Then there are um, different spacecraft, uh, AI spacecraft managers, and these managers uh, basically assess the high level situation and then choose um, and configure building blocks that do certain actions. So they basically compose the AI and therefore also um, control what the behavior is. And then there are the AI building blocks. And these building blocks have uh, certain, um, uh, yeah, certain responsibilities, certain scopes. And um, they analyze and execute a certain uh, aspect in detail. So there are target building blocks. These target uh, building blocks uh, mainly choose the next target of the spacecraft. So either fly to somewhere or attack something. And uh, there are certain, uh, let's say, building block implementations that um, implement uh, different policies. And this in turn is then controlled and chosen by the spacecraft manager, depending on the high level situation, which policy to use. So there's a target building block for artilleries to choose the closest target, to escort something, to control bandits, to control guards, or also for transporters. Uh, there is another kind of building block. These are these attack building blocks, and they uh, choose a certain attack pattern. So um, basically, um, if you attack another ship, you don't just fly into that ship and shoot. So um, you have to hold, for example, a certain range and also then organize and coordinate with other AIs, maybe attacking the same uh, target that they don't fly all to the same spot. And uh, yeah, you know, so there are certain uh, attack building blocks also taking care of that. Uh, so basically really where to fly, where to position. And then there is an engine controller also uh, implementing certain policies. The engine controller uh, controls the engines, so the yeah, engines and thrusters. And there can be also, of course, certain policies like um, uh, I needs to escape or needs to follow a certain target or intercept something, be passive or just stop. So these are different engine controllers. And also, um, other building blocks uh, that execute sensors or weapons controls. Also, of course, the weapons need to be controlled. There are also feedback loops between these building blocks and also partly um, with the orchestrator or the manager. Like, for example, um, the um, target building block chooses a target to attack. The engine controller needs to rotate an engine to fly there. But then um, it's idle because it already reached the speed that is needed to intercept the target. The weapon controller um, determines that the weapon would be already in range, but the ship needs to rotate 
that uh, the weapon can actually shoot. So then there must be a feedback loop again to the engine controller to rotate and so on. So there are also some dependencies between these um, building blocks. Yeah. Um, evasion is also a part. So this is uh, mainly a part of the engine controller. And uh, yeah, it may surprise, but evasion really um, was uh, one of the hardest um, single algorithms and parts of the whole game to implement. And it's still not perfect. And I'm really fitting with it around for several years already. And um, yeah, I will demonstrate evasion uh, here. Okay, so there's an AI ship and the path is obviously blocked by a big asteroid. So it detects that and then it automatically calculates how to avoid that asteroid. So first it uh, flies to the right point and then the next target is the tip of the arrow. So basically it flies around it. Sounds easy, but of course you have to consider that this is a fully dynamic system. So in this scenario, both um, objects are moving. You can see it already predicts the movement of the other object and um, then also does it accordingly. These red squares are another type of evasion. So there's basically an area around each object and each ship that is a no-go zone. So um, each AI really tries to avoid these squares as well. Yeah, and then uh, basically evasion was successful and uh, then they continue to fly to their destination. What it really makes so hard in the real game are two things. First, it's a really highly dynamic system. It's not only like in these examples that there are two bodies uh, maybe moving and colliding, but there are many bodies in the area and uh, many bodies are in the way. And then there are also decisions like left side or right side and so on. And this really has to be calculated and smart. And the other thing is that the ships are really simulated like in space. This means that you have uh, thrust vectors and movement vectors and so on. And it takes a time until a ship really reacts to some changes. And also this makes it very hard, of course. So um, next is AI crew. So I talked a lot now about the AI that controls ships. And there is also another type of AI that controls the crew inside a ship. So uh, really in that game, everything is simulated, also like the ship control. So uh, it's not like uh, cheated and, hey, I have a crew. OK, just repair the tile. No, um, it really orders the crew to move somewhere, to repair it and so on. And this is um, done with the automation handlers and the crew automations that all can also be used by the players to automate certain um, tasks that uh, may be uh, repeating and uh, maybe um, if the, if, especially in single player mode um, that may too demanding to take care of all the micromanagements, certain actions can be automated. So there's again that AI server module that again uh, does all the high level management of the AIs and process flow. Then there's again an AI crew manager. It uh, assesses the high level situation, assigns roles to the crew members and assigns uh, action automa oh, sorry, automa automation handlers to the crew members. And these automation handlers then of course um, decide about the behavior what the crew member then is doing. The crew manager has a single or multi-crew mode. So if uh, there are multiple crew members, it needs a different behavior than if there's only one single crew member in the ship. Or also maybe if, so if there is multi-crew, but uh, all, all but one are dead, for example, then there must be also some handling about that. So as I mentioned, uh, crew members are assigned certain roles. And there are also priorities. So like, uh, for example, it's nice to repair something, but now your uh, only other crew member left uh, died. So suddenly or immediately revive him. Then there are these automation handlers. Um, 
these uh, similar to the um, base shape AI uh, do it on a high level so they analyze a certain situation and choose the next action to do so there are certain automation handlers uh, there's a console operator um, one for healing repairing resupplying reviving and then there are these automation actions and these really execute certain actions like for example move from a to b repair this resupply that and so on so uh, there are certain layers and levels and uh, specializations and this is how the ai crew works client event system completely different topic so um i already talked in the beginning of the talk uh, about messaging and uh, there are of course also internal message in the server and in the client but especially in the client um, there is a bit more flexibility and uh, yeah a bit more flexibility needed so um, in addition to the messaging system in the client there's also an event system so uh, what is an event an event is a certain um, thing that happened or it can also be a message to another module that something should happen so uh, both is possible so it can be also something like a message uh, the interesting thing is an event has a time to live so there are persistent events so you fire an event and then this event stays active every turn every frame again there are one-shot events so these are let's say classic events like something happened and there are also events that are persistent for a certain number of frames this is for example um, very useful if a certain module wants to draw an effect for a second then it can just create an event that instructs the viewport module to draw that effect as a certain location and uh, the event has a time to live of um, for example if 60 frames per second is active in the options then for 60 frames and then it uh, the effect will be visible for one second uh, events can be exclusive this is of course is uh, mostly important for events with a certain lifetime so this means that um, they are active until uh, a new one of the same type is fired then uh, it will be replaced and there are priority events priority events are managed by a, a separate event queue and um, yeah this is about timing so normally um, an event is always a result of something that has been processed so um, you know there's that input uh, processing output pattern and an event is usually an output and will be then input for the next execution of the next frame so like for example i received a message from the server i uh, process something and then with the next frame um, an event that was created based on that processing is then processed again by another module um, these priority events are important for everything that is visible um, to reduce latency. For example, I receive or yeah, I receive a message uh, in the on the client that the mouse has been moved, and uh, there's an effect to highlight something where the mouse cursor is. Then it is very important to to uh, process that event to draw something at the position of the mouse curve still in the same frame to minimize uh, input latency and therefore we have these priority events so uh, these events are managed by an event manager it contains a list of events uh, some lookup maps snapshots and so on has certain methods to fire events to manage these events to also iterate over these events usually uh, when processing with the next frame and then uh, modules uh, in this case on client side client modules then have a callback on event so they subscribe certain types of events and then they get a callback 
And uh, the general module execution, there are three stages before, between and after events. And all priority events that are uh, created in an event handler or in the before or between events uh, callbacks are ensured also to be executed still in the same frame. So to reduce latency. There are certain types of client events. Uh, so some examples of one-shot events would be, for example, in game session update event um, to inform certain modules that there was a game session update from the server in particular that, for example, a player joined the game session and the social module needs to update the list of players. Um, the UI control event uh, is very important. So every control in the UI, like a button, like a label where you can hover, like a slider where you can select something, uh, every action you do resides in a UI control event. This can be then processed by modules. And uh, for example, if you clicked on a button, then something can happen. Some examples of events that have a time to live or are persistent are, for example, the current objective event. This uh, indicates your current objective of your mission you're currently doing. That there's a window and um, your current objective is a persistent event. Or entity selection event, even easier to explain. You click on an entity, for example, your crew member or a laser weapon, it is selected. And as long as it is selected, it is a persistent event, basically. Um, yeah, there are some examples for priority events, and these are mostly UI, uh, really UI related events like uh, mouse cursor events, uh, click on something on a tile, mouse has been moved over tile, um, tile base event, um, yeah. These uh, are events uh, to draw something. So um, the viewport module will uh, then draw based on events. This is important because not all um, callback handlers uh, have uh, this list of rendering business objects. Oh, this will come later in a slide, but yeah. So there are events to draw things. And uh, for example, effect event to draw a certain effect at a certain location. And these, of course, uh, have to be executed in the same frame to minimize latency. Yeah, here's the slide about the <laughs> rendering business objects. So, um, generally, this uh, slide describes how the rendering works. So, basically, everything you see, how this is drawn, how this is rendered. So, um, what I do from technology point of view, um, I use uh, Java 2D graphics 2D double buffering as a rendering mechanism. So this is basically a um, mecha mechanism to yeah, draw built in deep in the Java framework. There would be other options like OpenGL and so on. And uh, there's an, also an option in the future to switch to that, but I have chosen the Java 2D, so the built-in functionality, and also works quite well for me. So um, the renderer is quite um, encapsulated from the modules that are actually um, yeah, implementing all the business logic and decide what to render. So there's an interface uh, renderer and an implementation uh, graphics 2D renderer. And um, what to render is, oops, is um, defined with so-called uh, rendering business objects. So a business object could be, for example, to draw a certain effect somewhere or draw font to draw a text somewhere or draw window to draw a window, but really only the window without the content. Somewhere. So these are the different, let's say, building blocks or primitives that uh, draw something. And uh, also these are quite uh, encapsulated. So um, there's an interface rendering BO, there's an abstract rendering business object, then uh, there is the implementation, the abstract implementation that is 
using that technology I'm using and then the concrete implementation. And there are also um, intermediate interfaces for certain types of rendering business objects like the draw effect. Um, business object has also an interface and yeah, basically all of them have their own interfaces. Now you're wondering why is this encapsulated that much this is because uh, you, you can see that in the next slide, this is how the rendering is separated from the logic from the modules that actually decide what to render. So of course, this is now a bit Java code, but it's uh, hopefully easy enough to understand. So basically the Java code only works really with the interfaces. So the Java code doesn't know something about graphics 2D or maybe at some later point OpenGL or whatever is used to, to render something. It only works with these interfaces. So it's really encapsulated away from it. And um, yeah, this has really the advantage that at some point I could switch the renderer or completely re-implement the renderer and as long as the interfaces stay stable, which they will probably, um, the all the code that is of course lots of more code that defines actually what to render is completely not affected. And yeah, basically also this is um, uh, on the right you see what is actually rendered. It's about this button here above, so the button and the window, the window is they are created here and here is the, in this case, control rendering business object created for the button. So this is how you draw a button somewhere. It has certain properties like an ID. This ID is, of course, for example, then referenced. If you click on the button, get an event, an UI control event that you clicked on the button, then with the ID also you know what button it was. Um, yeah, the type of the, that is, is a button because there are different kinds of controls like buttons, like sliders, like uh, whatever. Uh, button has a caption, of course. Uh, it is uh, also using the localization manager. So there's a translation ID and then depending on what the language the user is using, it is displayed in English or German, for example. The button is visible. It has a certain dimension and a certain position. Now you're wondering, hey, that dimension is hard coded. What if I have a bigger screen resolution? What happens then? This is also an important and interesting thing about the renderer. So um, the renderer internally, at least the, let's say, the module, the, the business logic part, works with a reference resolution of 1080p, so 1920, uh, by 1080. And the actual screen resolution is then uh, really uh, transparently translated in the renderer itself. So the, the business object code works with 1080p internally, but uh, the renderer then translates and scales it to the actual resolution and it is scaled before it is drawn. So it is uh, really then drawn in the native resolution, that button. So you don't have anything that is blurred or something because it was scaled. It is then drawn in the native resolution. Last thing is there is also a pool of rendering business objects. Um, this is important because, um, you know, there are really lots of UI elements and really everything is a rendering bureau all you are seeing also for example, every tile, every floor, every wall, every button, every window, every everything. So there are thousands of rendering bureaus per frame uh, in a scene. And uh, the game runs at 60 frames per second. So you have thousands of rendering bureaus per frame times 60 per second. So this is really lots of um, objects, of course. Therefore, these are uh, pooled, so these are reused. And this greatly improves performance and reduces the memory footprint and garbage collector um, load. Okay, so maybe a really high level breakdown how the uh, graphics to the double buffering renderer works. So um, how basically a rendering cycle looks like. Very simplified indeed. Uh, so first of all, uh, all the um, events and messages uh, are, that, that occur are processed in a cycle. 
by modules and uh, based on that, but also of, based on general logic uh, per frame, the modules generate then all the rendering BOs that describe what is basically drawn. So the modules decide what is drawn. Then the renderer um, executes all the business objects themselves and the business objects contain logic that actually draw it to a buffer. But that buffer is not displayed yet. So it's, it's just drawn to a buffer. So like draw that button here, so a line, then fill it with something, draw a texture that in the end a button appears. This is done by the rendering BOs. Uh, then when everything is drawn, I mean, we have a fixed frame rate of, uh, for example, 60 frames per second. So then we have to ensure that we keep that fixed frame rate. That is uh, all the movements and the animations are smooth. It is very important. It is very, very uh, consistent. And this is done with a so-called spin weight. A spin weight is basically a very precise sleep. So, um, for example, 60 frames per second. This is, uh, let's uh, keep it simple. These, these are roughly 60 milliseconds per frame uh, and per cycle. And for example, all that stuff took only four milliseconds. So there are 12 milliseconds left until uh, the next frame or the next cycle starts. So now I have to very precisely wait for 12 milliseconds. And of course, it's uh, more like 11. Dot nine five two five something so really um to the nanoseconds um precise because uh, if it's only precise uh, by one millisecond this would be quite inconsistent and it would be really not pleasant to to play the game then so the spin weight basically what it does is um it just doesn't sleep it also doesn't just uh, nano sleep because uh, this is quite not accurate enough it basically uh, spins in a loop and pulls the uh, act, pulls the uh, the actual nanoseconds until really the deadline has been arrived. So it's an active weight, and to make that a bit better, it yields the threat to the operating system all the time with every iteration. So this only interrupts it for a very short time, but it greatly. Um, enables the operating system also to do some other work also for other threads of the game client. So basically it's a very precise sleep. Then um, the next rendering cycle starts and first of all the frame is then displayed and it is called double buffering because it uh, always has two buffers and these buffers flip every frame. So one buffer is shown and the other one is used to draw the next frame. And then it flips and then it starts again. Okay, tile sets. Um, yeah, also of course part of the renderer. So first of all, some class diagrams again. So um, again, also the tile sets are of course um, managed, uh, let's say, independent of the actual renderer, but then with concrete implementations, but then, of course, interchangeable. So like also the renderer itself, but of course, a certain tie set manager is bound to a certain renderer because it contains also really rendering specific logic uh, data structures and so on. So we have an interface tie set manager, an abstract tie set manager, and then a concrete implementation for also the renderer that is in use. And uh, that uh, graphics to detail set manager, for example, also already uh, caches um, affine transformations of these tile sets. This means that, uh, you know, the ships can be flipped by 90 degrees. So there are in total four different directions. The ship can be flipped. And this means also the um, tile sets can be rotated and this is these uh, rotated tile sets are already cached in the tile set manager so that if I need a certain uh, rotation, I already have it as a tile set. Uh, on the right, um, you can see an example, one of the uh, game core tile sets with uh, all different systems and weapons and propulsions and so on. And uh, as you maybe can see, um, I'm using GIMP uh, this is the software, the GIMP 
um, to actually draw all the tiles so it's really by hand. So there are certain layers and yeah, all are really hand drawn. In the beginning during the game development I tried to maybe render all the tiles with Blender but uh, I quickly <laughs> Uh, stop that uh, doing that and uh, switch to really drawing it by hand because it would have been a completely different style of graphics and yeah, I like it that way. Okay. Oh yeah, um, tile cache also important. So here's a ship that is rendered and um, of course the um, the um, ships and all stuff that basically represents the world is um, based on tiles. This means on fixed um, on a fixed grid or fixed positions, and something is in there or not. And um, of course, it would be also quite expensive to draw everything all the time with every frame, sixty times per second. So you have, you know, first that uh, tile for that floor, then that cable, then above of that maybe the wall and that uh, O2 vent and so on. The effects here, that status bar and uh, yeah, that icon maybe. So it would be very expensive to draw that all the time again. Therefore these uh, drawn tiles are then cached. And this is how the internal tile cache looks like. So all the tiles that have been rendered are cached there and then they can they're ready, are ready to use and can be reused in the next frame already. It just needs to be copied to the buffer. As you can see, also certain UI elements of the menus can be cached in the tile cache. So this also really greatly improves the performance. Uh, translations. Oh, this is uh, yeah also an important part, but uh, probably not, nobody thinks about it. And this was also one of the more complex and complicated parts. So translations means I have a certain tile and uh, first of all in the game world that tile is on a certain position that is in, yeah, called internal world position and for example that position is 13x and 7y. And um, But then you have your viewport. Of course you don't see the whole game world uh, at once you only see a certain part of it in the in the window you, you're looking at, at the world. So this is then the relative view position. So from the upper left corner, it would be then on position 16, 8. Then uh, there's also, of course, uh, everything for everything in absolute position. So this is really the pixel, the pixel of the window where it is rendered. This would be 1079 in this example by 561. And uh, then it's a bit more complicated. Uh, basically, when rendering a certain tile, you need to get from the world position to the absolute position. But there can be more offsets and things to consider, like the so-called subtile offset. These are, uh, for example, used um, for move animations of composite entities. So like when your ship is moving from A to B, um, with every new turn, you see that animation that it moves to the next tiles. And uh, these are the offsets to the absolute positions, subtile offset. Then there's also an animation offset inside ships. So this is not about the ships themselves, but additional to that, also, for example, a crew member inside of the ship at the same time when the ship moves can also move from one to another tile. This is also an animation. This would be then the animation offset. Then there is a zoom factor in general. It's about scaling. So you can zoom in and out your viewport. And then it's also a global scaling factor because, um, I mean, you can have a different screen resolution and uh, then also the game may be scaled to a different screen solution or also in the options uh, you can uh, yeah, um, configure as a global zoom level. So to zoom, to make everything bigger or smaller, this would be this global scale factor. So lots of factors and offsets in that calculation. And the big issue were rounding errors, because if you don't round everything correctly, 
animations uh, don't look straight anymore, especially if they go don't go just uh, 90 degrees angels, but uh, yeah, various degrees and they really look non-pleasant if you don't have the rounding arrows right. One word about client performance. So um, the client has uh, quite some uh, good optimization level already. So, I mean, I already talked a lot and uh, you probably have uh, already an understanding that there's really lots of stuff going on in the background um, and uh, lots of different systems. Nevertheless, so uh, per second, there's about a allocation rate of 40 megabytes of memory. This is literally special for Java like nothing. And uh, also the frame times, uh, I mean, the 60 FPS are fixed, but also um, 120 or 240 FPS would be possible. So for example, on my machine, okay, I have to admit it's uh, quite a high-end machine, but nevertheless, uh, rendering of one frame. And I mean, not only the rendering, but the whole calculation with everything in it takes four milliseconds. So, um, and this is uh, already quite a busy scene there. So yeah, quite okay, I guess. Um, yeah, next uh, about the game server, just a quick overview. So um, as I already mentioned, uh, the game server can be embedded in the game client or can be also a dedicated application. And also the official servers hosted by me are dedicated uh, applications, so dedicated servers, but with uh, certain additional uh, functionalities uh, to also make map, uh, sorry, matchmaking possible. And yeah, in general, everything is uh, really a client server architecture, therefore also the embedded server. So um, the, the main approach is really security by server. So the client really only displays the state of the game and the server everything calculates and changes the state and the uh, reason for that is for example to prevent cheating so especially on the official servers because the state is changed on the server cheaters cannot do much because the clients only get incremental streamed exactly what they have can see and have to see and uh, the clients cannot just uh, for example with a mod do something weird and change stuff because this is everything done on server side and especially for the official servers of course uh, modders or other players don't have access to that so yeah i mean in general to have a proper client server architecture and really uh, separate the display and the change of state also has other advantages to make uh, your overall system yeah more maintainable more manageable and yeah, ultimately cleaner. One word about the official servers. So um, basically there are always, um, let's say um, the official servers are always redundant so that also downtime free updates are possible. And a server consists of several instances. Um, usually it would be um, the number of CPUs of that yeah, machine minus two and these other two threads are needed for uh, the network threads and so on. And um, then an instance can host several game sessions at once. And um, my measurements show that a game, uh, an instance, so one, let's say, normal server CPU is able to serve about 100 uh, game sessions. Matchmaking options. So, first of all, you can, of course, play single player, but you can also host your own multiplayer session and then either play with friends or with um, other members of the community. Um, so you can play on an official server, just uh, press the official button. And uh, this is, of course, also recommended because this provides the best anti-cheat protection and so on. But you can also host your own custom game server just with the embedded server that is embedded in the client. Uh, for internet play, the only thing you need to do is uh, forward port 2017. 
and uh, for local area network games of course uh, they uh, your friends can just connect to your machine directly and uh, there's also the dedicated server shipped with the game so uh, you could also host uh, for example on a v server in the internet an own dedicated server if you want uh, if you want to join a game session um, first of all uh, the easiest way is to do this by quick join code so there's a code uh, just enter it uh, there on client on the client side connect uh, it will um, send that code to the meter server the meter server uh, knows the game session and the ip address behind that code and uh, then the client can connect there's of course also a game browser where you can browse games filter search for games and then connect this way or you can just uh, directly enter an ip address or domain or host name and connect directly this is of course also um, very useful and will be used for local area network games uh, you can play either pvp pve or co-op uh, co-op means means that um, each player joins the same ship but uh, you can also join each player can also join separate ships speaking of the meter server the meter server provides uh, essential and important uh, services for the various uh, game clients dedicated or official servers and the admin tool so the game client uh, and when you want to play a game um, meter server provides the game browser can resolve quick join codes and uh, also if you consent and uh, are willing to help improving the game uh, the client will also send error reports to the meter server um, when you host a custom game then uh, your client will also announce that game session if you enable it and consent of course um, will announce the game session to the meter server and uh, same of course uh, the dedicated server will also announce the game sessions there the official server will also in addition to that uh, provide anonymized statistics to the meter server um, but really anonymous so really like uh, player counts and nothing more and um, it will also pull uh, certain operations um, that are related to server management from the meter server and also send error reports there and there's that admin tool that also makes use of that meter server so um, with the admin tool i can quickly check the health status of all the official servers i can manage the official servers like bringing certain servers up or down schedule downtimes and so on I can read the statistics and also read all the error reports. Game design balancing. Yeah, this is uh, also, of course, uh, completely different than meter servers or servers or entities. So, um, but also important part. So um, just to bring that into perspective. So in the game, there are four types of mesh, three types of fields two types of uh, propulsion, seven general types of weapons with uh, really dozens of actual weapon entities with different properties. There are different kinds of systems, producers, buffers, emitters, sensors, collectors, storage, and so on. Different kind of structures, armor. All modules are in three different sizes, S, M, and L. There is a processing system, crafting system, upgrade system. There are also entity mods. So uh, in the campaign, you can also modify, for example, your laser weapon to fire faster or, or stronger or whatever. Also, this is possible. In total, there are 350 different entities in the entity definition. And uh, of course, everything, of course, needs to be balanced. Therefore, I modeled the game in various excel sheets this is just one part of one of them to to have a model to see exactly when i change uh, one certain parameter what effect this has on other aspects and other parameters and this way i narrowed down the balancing of course also did uh, lots of playtesting and so on 
but uh, this modeling is also important for the overall balancing. Ship editor. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, in the game client, there's also a ship editor embedded. And with the ship editor, as the name already implies, you can build and create your own ships. In fact, I also created all the different assets, all the different AI ships and so on, the stations, everything you see in the game also with that embedded ship editor. And yeah, uh, you can, you have, of course, there are menu, create a new ship, load, save, import, export, share, uh, set uh, certain properties like which type of ship, whether it's a space station, whether it has that fixed size or a bigger size and so on. Uh, you can see whether there are some issues with the ship, like, uh, for example, a wall is missing or some entity would be floating in the space and so on. So there's a validation, of course, that the ship then also makes sense. Uh, you can place entities, uh, different categories, structures, slots, floors, systems, and so on. It's also filtered based on the ship class that is selected so that you only see what the chip class allows. So for example, here you don't see all the uh, large modules. Uh, speaking of ship classes, you can, of course, select the ship class. You can get infos about all fields, about all meshes, in this case also about propulsion. So uh, depending on the um, weight of the ship, um, you can check whether propulsion is sufficient or not, so whether you get enough acceleration. And uh, yeah, that's basically the ship editor. Scene editor. Um, scenes are stages or also called levels. So um, basically this is a level editor. And like ship editor, first you have the menu bar to create new, load, save, import, export, and so on. And uh, yeah, then you can place uh, all the different um, entities or composite entities or factories uh, to the scene. Like for example, this is a factory or this one is selected. This is a factory that then will spawn a ship. You can set certain properties like which one, uh, which uh, kind of AI will be activated or enabled for this ship how many, which team, and so on. And there are certain uh, other of these factories or also entity, or composite entities that can be placed like asteroids, like uh, waypoints. For example, if a AI should patrol certain waypoints, you can place them there. So this is basically how scenes work. And uh, then later in the game, these uh, scenes can either be played standalone as a custom game. So you can, for example, also create some kind of scenario uh, attack a mighty base which was created before also by you with the ship editor for example and try it with friends or um, in case of the campaign then the uh, overall uh, campaign consists of several of these scenes placed at different locations in between is an environment generator generating asteroids that uh, also the environment looks nice and yeah this is basically how these scenes work Completely different topic, audio production. I mean, I already talked about tile sets uh, that I hand draw, or um, now these uh, scenes or ships that I'm creating, entities and so on, balancing. And one important thing that is often overlooked, but is also very important for games, is of course audio. And uh, fortunately, uh, I used to play piano and keyboard when I was younger, and I'm still also a hobby music producer. So um, this, uh, of course, is quite handy. So really everything in the game is really composed and produced by myself. I already produced 14 music tracks and there will be still some more coming. And also all the effects you can hear in the game. Right now there are in total 27 different effects, but there will be probably also some more. Um, in general about the effects, um, I'm a bit, uh, let's say, uh, for me it's important that these effects are not too much in the foreground. It's really important to get some audio feedback, of course, for certain alarms, certain things you have done. 
but it should be really decent and be in the background and not annoy you after some time. About the music, um, there are themes and ambient tracks. The themes are more in the foreground, maybe a bit more emotional, and uh, yeah, mostly themes in the campaign for certain encounters or certain locations, like the last outpost has its own theme, for example. Um, when you enter some later stage, a club, then there's club music, and these are themes. Or also for certain uh, boss encounters or fights, are also certain teams themes. Um, and there are of course also ambient tracks. These are all the music tracks that are running in between and are a bit more decent and in the background uh, that uh, you can also hear them quite often in the loop and are not annoyed after some time. <laughs> and uh, right now all these music tracks already have over two hours playtime, but there will be also still some follow. Uh, software, I use uh, a digital audio workstation. It's called Sonar. It's uh, really quite powerful and was also, by the way, quite expensive when I bought it. Uh, but unfortunately, in the meantime, this software has been discontinued. But uh, yeah, still very good. I mean, I have a license and yeah, it's quite nice with all the plugins, with all the instruments and so on, and really does the job. And uh, I also have uh, some hardware, of course, uh, I'm not a pro, really only hobby producer. But I have a small uh, MIDI keyboard from Akai. I have a Korg Nano Control 2 mixer, and um, I also have a dedicated Asus Sonar sound card. This is especially important for the ASIO uh, drivers, because uh, you have really have to imagine, especially when you play something with the MIDI keyboard, it is really important to have as low latency as possible. And for that, you need these ASIO drivers, uh, that you don't have any delay when pressing uh, on the keyboard, uh, th this is it really doesn't work. Yeah, the last outpost. Uh, last outpost is the main campaign, and uh, yeah, the last rebel outpost got spotted by Imperial scouts, and your goal is to relocate the outpost before the main fleet attacks. Sounds pretty standard, but uh, yeah, there is some story behind, and it also develops. And of course, I also don't want to spoil everything here. Uh, by the way, this uh, what you see here is the outpost, and the outpost is basically built in a big asteroid. Uh, yeah, because they want to hide, of course. Uh, but yeah, got spotted. So um, first of all, of course, the last outpost uh, campaign consists of uh, several main missions. Um, the main missions are um, they are in five chapters. Each chapter marks a certain milestone to reach that goal, to relocate and save the outpost. Um, there are several random elements in these uh, main missions, and also uh, from a certain pool, certain different scenarios are also randomly chosen each playthrough. This means that if you play that game through several times, you will definitely get different missions every time. Some key missions are the same, but also have uh, sometimes some, say, random elements in it. But you will also have really a lot of um, different missions then, that uh, it's really also possible and also will be fun to have several playthroughs, maybe also with different challenges, with different starting conditions. And uh, in later slide, you see that there are also different modes of that campaign. And um, in addition to the uh, main story, there are also several side missions, of course, and random encounters uh, all the way through uh, to get more and also different loot, to get some certain blueprints for different ships, and so on. So, um, how this works is, as I mentioned already before when talking about the scene editor, so a mission consists of one or multiple scenes. These scenes are chosen uh, randomly from a certain pool that uh, you also get different missions every time or different yeah, different playthrough every time. And these scenes are spawned also within a certain range uh, and position relative to other scenes, so um, can also vary a bit depending on that. Um, and in between is a procedural generated environment. 
And this basically is a hybrid between an open world approach and handcrafted stages. On the right, you see uh, some uh, small part of the definition of these uh, stages. So basically there are several scenes then per stage defined and also different properties like the distance, whether it's placed next to something else and so on. The last outpost itself also offers some special services when you arrive there or when you dock there with your ship. You have a um, crafting system there. So of course, uh, during all the missions, during the journey, you uh, get a lot of loot and you can either process that loot to get basic materials. Uh, you can then use these materials uh, to upgrade certain modules you have. And you can also craft certain things like armor, like um, yeah, repair parts, like uh, missiles, torpedoes, and so on. Then there is also in the last outpost campaign an integrated ship editor. Uh, unlike the, let's say, the, the real ship editor, the goal is not to create own ships. But in uh, in context of the campaign, of the mission, uh, in the integrated ship editor, the scope is to modify your ship or also load a new ship if, uh, from a blueprint you found. So what you can do is you can do certain construction tasks like add, for example, new entities, like for example, a new weapon you found, uh, you, you, you looted, you can add it to your ship then. Uh, you can, of course, strip all the different entities, you can rotate them, you can connect with cables and so on. You can repair everything for free on the last outpost. You can mod your entities. This is what I mentioned uh, before uh, in the balancing slide. Um, all the different uh, entities like weapons, like uh, propulsion, like uh, different systems can also be modded with entity mods you can loot during the missions. A uh, mod can be, for example, that a laser fires more powerful or faster, or the shield um, emitter has a, another, um, how's that called, another uh, plateau, and so on. So very different mods. Um, you can upgrade, of course, your entities. Uh, I mentioned before there are three sizes. Of course, at the beginning of the campaign, you start your ship with size S. But uh, later on you find bigger modules, but you can with these basic materials also upgrade your modules, for example, from an S laser to an M laser. And these are, of course, then much more powerful. And this is also necessary. So um, also uh, with each chapter, also the environment, the missions, the, the enemies get more powerful and it will be more difficult. So you, yeah really have to manage and upgrade your ship. Um, you can load ship blueprints and of course also strip the old ship. Then there are different game modes in the campaign. So um, of course there's that normal and recommended uh, playthrough, but uh, maybe for the first playthrough, if it's a bit too demanding, you can also enable easy mode. Uh, then especially the AI enemies will be less aggressive. There's a hard mode. With the hard mode, you don't have checkpoints, so you cannot save or load the game in between. And uh, the ship you're starting is smaller, and the enemies are also harder. There's also a dedicated speedrun mode. The speedrun mode eliminates as much as RNG as it can. So with the speedrun mode, you always get the same playthrough. With the speedrun mode, there are no, is no environment in between. So no random asteroids you have to evade and uh, maybe then your whole run is destroyed. Uh, so it's really as deterministic as it can. And uh, on top, it also has um, already a counter integrated. And uh, this uh, counter will also be, this is not implemented yet, but planned, will be also connected to the meter server. This means that there will be also high scores on the meter server. You can compare your runs then. 
yeah you can also if you want play with custom ships this means with uh, ships of a certain ship class um, or at least compatible to a certain ship class uh, you have uh, you can build that in the ship editor then uh, ships at start uh, normally of course only you start with one ship but especially if you want to play the campaign multiplayer you can also start with multiple ships and then either each player can uh, yeah, join their own ships or you can also play with multiple players on one ship and for example one player is then responsible for navigation and another one for, for the weapons and so on yeah that's basically about the game modes progress uh, yeah so we are nearing the end of my talk um, so what is the progress as i mentioned i started in 2016 and uh, beginning of 2017 really started the main production of the game i'm really doing that in my spare time um, but uh, i was already made really good progress so all the game design is finished all the game core implementation so basically everything you saw in all the slides is finished and really working well all the tools are finished you saw on the slides the meter server is finished the tie sets are drawn of course uh, with all the entity definitions and so on the audio is mostly finished as i mentioned i will probably produce some more music tracks and maybe one or another audio effect but basically it's finished the uh, main thing i'm currently working on as of july 2022 is the last outpost campaign uh, of the main missions uh, four or five chapters are finished but uh, there's still all the side missions to do there's already a plan so um, maybe in one of the slides before you saw some um, flowchart of one of the main missions and basically there are for all the missions and side missions already such charts so there's already really a concept but yeah i have to produce it basically um, there are some additional game modes in plan uh, this is still to do of course then really lots of testing i mean i'm doing it all the time also with friends so really some friends are really helping me out there really big thank you for that so it's quite stable but still when everything is really finished it has to be extensively tested again also with different hardware with different operating systems by the way i'm producing and implementing and coding everything under linux but of course it also will run perfectly under windows the game mac in theory yes but i don't have any option to test anything because i don't have a mac sorry <laughs> so it will not be officially supported but yeah it's java so it should run and uh, yeah then of course there are also before i can really release it uh, also some organization and legal topics to cover like i have to uh, yeah found a company and so on because of legal and tax uh, reasons and so on this is also then to do i mean so you can see really most is already finished i'm really on the finishing line but still something to do i guess it will take mostly a year then i can release i will also not uh, hurry because um, this is would be really fatal if i uh, really i mean i'm working since 2016 really with lots of dedication on it and i really have to finish it right that uh, the game in the end is really good it's well balanced it's fun basically and that not not all the work is destroyed just because i rush it out and release it half a year too early but i guess one year is realistic yeah so this was a long talk i hope uh, one or another slide was really interesting i hope you got a good insight in in my game but also in general how games works because of course it's the uh, specific is a certain type of games as a 2d game it's a tie set based game but i mean still many things about the networking about how things are managed are universal and even just not don't just apply to games but also to general application software and i hope this was insightful and interesting thank you for your attention